Hi, this is Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Today we're going to be developing some Roland TR-808 mods for Claudio from my favorite synthesizer YouTube channel, Dr. Mix. The TR-808 was one of the last truly analog drum machines before the rise of the samplers. The Lin LM-1, which was introduced the same year as the TR-808, and many of the drum machines that followed made their sounds based on samples that were stored on EEPROM chips or other storage media. The TR-808 makes its sounds purely from analog circuitry, using discrete transistors, resistors, capacitors, and linear IC chips like op amps and OTAs. While some of the sounds may not sound as realistic as a sample, the circuits that create the sound can be modified to open up more possibilities. And that's what we're going to try to do today for Claudio. The clap is basically just white noise that's shaped by two separate VCAs. The service manual for the TR-808 has a nice little block diagram that shows how the clap sound is made. The trigger comes in here, and this WN is with white noise source. It's filtered by this band pass filter and then shaped by the two VCAs. This VCA is primarily responsible for the sound of the clap and it uses this sawtooth envelope which we'll take a closer look at in a second. The second VCA uses a longer envelope and gives sort of a simulated reverb effect. The service manual also shows how that sawtooth envelope is formed after the clap is triggered and how it contributes to the overall shape of the sound. So looking at this, there's a couple of timings we could play with to alter the sound. First, we could make this 30 millisecond period adjustable so the clap could be shorter or longer. We could also play with the timings of these little sawtooth waves and try to make the period of those adjustable. But I'm not sure that would have a very meaningful effect on the sound. Some other ideas would be to make the length of the reverb envelope adjustable so you can apply more or less of the effect and to play with the cutoff frequencies on this band pass filter to change the color of the noise used for the clap. So I can experiment with these circuits. I've built the two envelopes on breadboards. This is the reverb envelope and this is the sawtooth envelope. I've got a little tactile switch here so I can trigger the envelope and view it on my scope. So here I'll press the button and we can see the uh, sawtooth envelope triggering on my oscilloscope. The problem is my finger is not quite as fast as the TR-808 trigger signal, which is only one millisecond. So this waveform that we're seeing on the scope is a lot longer than it would be in the drum machine. You can see that there's quite a number of uh, sawtooth peaks in there when there should be only three. So I decided to breadboard another circuit that can better simulate the TR-808 trigger. This one uses the common 555 timer IC. With the 555 timer, by selecting values for these two resistors and this one capacitor, you can set the pulse width and duty cycle of the output. So I've selected a 1.5 microfarad capacitor and 100K and 1K resistors. This gives us a pulse wave that's low for one millisecond and high for 105 milliseconds. The problem with this is the TR-808 triggers on a high pulse, so this is actually the opposite of what we're looking for. The 555 timer can only output a waveform with a duty cycle of 50% or greater. So using the 555 alone, if I selected resistors and a capacitor that made the high time one millisecond, the longest it could be low would also be one millisecond. And that's not long enough for us to look at the envelopes we want to see and play with. So what I've done is I've added some additional parts to get the 555 to produce an inverted output. This is the circuit I'll be building on my breadboard. Here we've got the capacitor and the two resistors we came up with using the calculator. But you'll notice that R1 and the capacitor are flipped from the previous drawing. Before, this capacitor was down here and this resistor was up here. Here's a transistor and its two little friends to get the output inverted. And over here's a small ceramic capacitor to help with stability. So if we look at the output of pin 3, we've got a about a one millisecond pulse, which is what we're looking for. So now instead of the push button triggering the sawtooth envelope generator, I've hooked in the 555 trigger circuit to do the job. Now we've got a nice signal that's re-triggering on its own, so that frees up my hands to play around with other things. 
So our waveform looks substantially similar to the service manual. It's got this uh, period of sawtooth with about three sawtooths. Uh, the only thing is the time here is different than what the service manual shows. This is on five milliseconds per division, so we're looking at about seven milliseconds worth of uh, sawtooth waves there. So we'll have to keep that in the back of our heads as we move forward with this. So we want to mod the TR-808 by making some of the fixed timings of the two envelopes variable. Since this is all analog, the timing of things is set by how long it takes a capacitor of a specific value to charge or discharge through a resistor of a specific value. This is called an RC circuit. Not remote controlled circuit, but resistor capacitor circuit. Let's take a look at this first timing we want to change, this 30 milliseconds number here. This is the RC circuit that determines the length of the part of the envelope where the sawtooth waveforms can re-trigger. IC23 uses the symbol for an op amp, but this chip's actually a quad comparator. Roland used the AN6912, but many of you are familiar with the LM339, which is the same chip. When our clap trigger comes in here on pin 8 of the quad comparator, pin 14 goes low to negative 15 volts for one millisecond, quickly charging this capacitor C140 to negative 15 volts. The comparator has an open collector output, and the input here to the next comparator has a very high impedance, just like a traditional op amp. So after the trigger is gone, this RC circuit can do its thing independently of the comparator. And what's going to happen is the charge on this capacitor is going to drain back to ground through this resistor R350. Common sense would tell you the higher the capacitance of this capacitor, the more energy it can store and the longer it will take to drain through this resistor. The lower the capacitance of the capacitor, the less energy it can store and it will discharge quicker. Also, the greater the resistance of this resistor, the less current will flow through it and the longer it will take to discharge the capacitor. The lower the resistance, the more current will flow and the quicker it will discharge. In fact, the time it takes to discharge this capacitor is proportional to what's called the time constant of this RC circuit. The time constant of an RC circuit has a really simple formula. It's just the resistance in ohms times the capacitance in farads. So for this circuit, the time constant is one mega ohm times 2.7 nanofarads. And this works out to be a 2.7 millisecond time constant. A time constant isn't really how long it takes to discharge a capacitor fully, but rather it takes five time constants to fully discharge a capacitor. This chart shows the voltage curve of a discharging RC circuit. After one time constant, the voltage across the capacitor will have decreased 63% and after five time constants, it'll be fully discharged. However, in our TR-808 circuit, the next stage of the comparator is comparing this voltage against one-third of the negative supply rail. These three resistors, R353, 352, and 351, form a voltage divider. Since they're the same values, we'll have negative 15 volts here, negative 10 volts here, and negative five volts here at the fixed input to the comparator. Negative 5 volts is a 67% drop from the negative 15 volt rail. Remember I just showed that a capacitor discharges by 63% in one time constant? Well, that's close enough to say that the output of this comparator will toggle in one time constant of this RC circuit. So now we have some conflicting data. We analyzed the circuit that's in the service manual and came up with a 3 millisecond timing. But the service manual says it should be 30 milliseconds. Normally I'd look at the PCB, but I don't have a TR-808 here, so what do we do? I'm going to assume that there's a mistake on the schematic. I think a 3 millisecond clap envelope would be way too short for what we hear from the TR-808. I think the 30 millisecond number is more like it. So that means that the mistake is here. C140 is off by a factor of 10, and instead of 2.7 nanofarads, it really should be 27 nanofarads. Maybe one of you out there with a real TR-808 want to pop yours open and have a look and settle this mystery for everyone. But this wouldn't be the only mistake I spotted on the schematic. For example, just right over here, uh, this schematic shows the polarity of this capacitor, C144, with the positive side facing away from ground. But we know this capacitor is operating in the range of ground to negative 15 volts. 
So the positive side of the capacitor should be here on ground. So now that we have a little background on RC circuit timing, we can see how easily we can play with the timing of these envelopes. Generally, to make a circuit adjustable, we use a potentiometer, which is in essence a variable resistor. It would be nice to design these mods to be as easy to remove as they are to install. So we want to avoid doing things like cutting traces or changing component values or doing anything like that that isn't totally obvious to someone when they look at the circuit board. And we want to avoid that because we don't want to make it difficult for someone in the future who works on the machine to understand what's going on or what they'd need to do to remove our mods. So ideally to add a pot we'd want to wire it in parallel across the back of an existing resistor. When you put a resistor in parallel with another resistor, no matter how high the value of the resistor you're adding, you're always decreasing the net resistance. So in the case here, even if we used a one meg pot, the highest resistance we'd be able to get from it in parallel with this existing one meg resistor is 500K. And since the RC time constant, just R times C, if we cut our resistance in half, we know we're cutting our time constant in half. So if we just wire in a one meg pot in parallel with the existing resistor, the longest our clap envelope can be is 15 milliseconds, which means you won't be able to get the original sound anymore, and this mod alone would be unacceptable. So if we want this mod to be viable, we'll need to increase the value of this capacitor, and we can do that by soldering another capacitor in parallel with it. So assuming we can more easily get our hands on 100K pots, and that's what we'd be putting in parallel with the existing one meg resistor, and we want the midpoint of the pot, or 50K, to give us the 27 milliseconds time constant that was there in the original design, we can calculate that we need a total capacitance here of 560 nanofarads. Accounting for the 27 nanofarad capacitor that's already there, we'd want to solder a capacitor with the closest standard value in parallel with it to do this mod. In this case, that would be 470 nanofarads. Of course, you don't need to do any math to come up with this modification. If you get the concept that a greater capacitance means a longer time and a lower resistance means a shorter time, you can just play around with these values until you find something that works. But doing a tiny bit of simple math cuts out a lot of trial and error guesswork. So back to the breadboard, first I changed out the 2.7 nanofarad capacitor uh, with this Mylar film 27 nanofarad capacitor to correct what I think is a mistake in the schematic. And we can see here on the oscilloscope we're on 10 milliseconds per division now and the length of this sawtooth period, uh, the sawtooth portion of the envelope is now three divisions or 30 milliseconds. Uh, so that is in line with what the service manual says, and, and I do believe that, uh, that there is a mistake in the schematic there. The capacitor is probably a 27 nanofarad capacitor in the actual drum machine. Uh, you'll notice that there are more sawtooth peaks in that portion than on the diagram in the service manual. And that could be a mistake that I made breadboarding that part of the circuit. It could be another mistake in the service manual. Uh, or it could be that I used uh, ceramic capacitors instead of film capacitors. Ceramic capacitors have much higher tolerances than film capacitors. But regardless, we're not really interested in that portion of the timing at this point in time. We're mainly concerned with this 30 millisecond number. So here I've got two decade boxes, one for resistance and one for capacitance. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to wire these in parallel with the existing resistor and capacitor. The decade boxes are cool. What I can do is I can dial up the value of any resistor or capacitor that I want. And this is great for prototyping and experimenting because unlike a pot where you don't know what value it's set to as you adjust it, with these you always know the value of the resistance or capacitance you're using. So I've dialed in 470 nanofarads for the fixed capacitor I plan to tell Claudio to add and 50 kilo ohms to simulate the pot he'll be adding set at its midpoint. And we've got pretty much the same waveform that we had before we hooked up these decade boxes. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate turning the pot of this mod by, by lowering the resistance of the decade box. So we're at 50K, now we're at 40, 30, 20, 10, 1K. We'll go back up, 10, 50, 60, 70, 80. 90, 100K. 
So this shows visually what this mod of, is capable of doing to the envelope. We've taken a fixed envelope length of 30 milliseconds and we've made it adjustable from just a few milliseconds all the way up to what looks like 50 milliseconds. I'll apply the same principle to make the reverb envelope adjustable by playing with R348 and C139 and the bandpass filter of the white noise by playing with R332 and C127. Also there's an easy mod that can be done by changing out this offset trimmer for a pot. I'll put a link in the video description to a page where you can get the component values and instructions for the mods I've come up with. Also, I'll keep that up to date based on any revisions from feedback from Claudio or anyone else who tries these on their TR-808. Without an actual TR-808 here to try these mods on, I'm kind of designing them blindly. Ideally, I'd like to be able to try them out, hear what they do to the sound, and tweak things if necessary. So we'll have to see how these mods work out in practice. I'll report back to Claudio with instructions he can give his guy on how to make these mods to his TR-808. And I'll put a link in the description below to the Dr. Mix video where he shows these mods completed and in use. So if you're not already a subscriber, please cruise on over and subscribe to the Dr. Mix channel so you don't miss out. Hopefully this was an interesting look at RC circuits and designing modifications that affect the timing of analog circuits. The same principles that we used here can be used to modify the other TR-808 sounds or any other analog synthesizer gear. This has been SynthChaser from SynthChaser.com. Thanks for watching and have a great day.